When responding to some of my videos on queerness in Disney, many people have suggested that I cover particular songs. These songs are typically selections that hold a particular emotional significance for some people or have become popular within the LGBT community for their depictions of isolation and identity. They're also usually I want songs, pieces of music that often focus on characters exploring what they need to feel fulfilled. Instead of making separate videos about these specific songs, I would rather explore the general form that they follow. No Disney I want songs feature openly LGBT protagonists, but many of them have been formative for LGBT people discovering or expressing their identities. Though some might think this trend is purely coincidental, there's actually a good deal of history behind it. So without further ado, let's talk about why many Disney songs sound so queer. Fun to be free, to be on the move, to go for a hike or whatever you like to do. When speaking about Disney songs, it's hard to avoid the impact that I Want songs have had on the company. Not only are they some of the most iconic songs in the company's catalog, but they're also the songs that have had the most notable impact on the art form of musical theater as a whole. The definition behind I Want songs is most often traced to Howard Ashman, the Disney lyricist who summed up the archetype with the following quote. In almost every musical ever written, there's a place, it's usually about the third song of the evening, sometimes it's the second, sometimes it's the fourth, but it's quite early. And the leading lady usually sits down on something. Sometimes it's a tree stump in Brigadoon. Sometimes it's um, under the pillars of Covent Garden in My Fair Lady, or it's a trash can in Little Shop of Horrors. But the leading lady sits down on something and sings about what she wants in life. And the audience falls in love with her and then roots for her to get it for the rest of the night. Despite the term I Want Song being most associated with Ashman, he did not coin the term. The composer Stephen Schwartz, who also has an extensive history with Disney, attributes the term to Lehman Engel, the composer and conductor who founded the BMI Lehman Engel Musical Theatre Workshop. This workshop brings together composers, lyricists, and librettists to create works together and continues to have an influence on the musical theatre world to this day. Howard Ashman also met composer and collaborator Alan Menken while attending this workshop, so it makes sense that he would first hear of this concept from Lehman Engel. That being said, as far as I know, there's no record of Engel's exact definition for I Want songs, only a reported anecdote from Schwartz and the aforementioned quote from Ashman, so keep that in mind. Though the definition for I Want songs was coined in the second half of the 20th century, they actually existed in both musical theater history and the Disney catalog beforehand. In Disney films, they also did not adhere to concrete rules like in Howard Ashman's quote. For example, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs has two I Want songs, I'm Wishing, which is at the beginning of the film, and Someday My Prince Will Come, which appears over halfway through the movie. In his video series on I Want Songs, Musical Theatre Mash does a good job of clarifying the difference between an I Want Song and the I Want Song. For example, any character in a musical can sing a song about wanting something, but a proper I Want Song is typically sung by a protagonist and helps define the trajectory of the narrative. Though I Want to Be Like You from the Jungle Book is a song in which King Louis wants something, it does not play a significant role in the protagonist's arc. Like Ashman mentioned, the history of I Want Songs also isn't unique to Disney films. One of the most notable examples of all time is Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz, a song that finds the protagonist Dorothy aimlessly wondering if she'll be able to find fulfillment. Over the Rainbow also sets the stage for Dorothy's adventures in Oz, setting a fantastical lyrical contrast to the sepia tone atmosphere of the first part of the film. Another thing I appreciate about Musical Theatre Mash's videos on I Want Songs is that they separate the topic into three subcategories. Existential comparative I Want Songs usually involve a protagonist longing for some type of existential purpose that can't be clearly defined. The motivation for finding one's purpose is often driven by a comparison to those in the surrounding narrative or society. Society. A good example of this is Purpose from Avenue Q in which Princeton wonders, everyone else has a purpose, so what's mine? Within the Disney catalog, an example of this would be the Belle reprise from Beauty and the Beast. She doesn't identify wanting specific things other than adventure in the Great Wide somewhere and so much more than they've got planned. Her motivation is not only vague, but it's also in contrast to the society around her and her upbringing. She doesn't want to be locked down in a small town like others. Concrete execution I want songs involve a character wanting something that can be concretely defined. Within the catalog of Disney songs, part of your world from The Little Mermaid fits into this category. She wants to be a human, and therefore she has to become a human. 
Ashman already had experience in this category due to his song Somewhere That's Green from Little Shop of Horrors. In fact, Part of Your World was jokingly called Somewhere That's Wet during production because of this precedent. Humanistic convincing I want songs usually have the protagonist wanting to either express or find their true nature in order to prove something to others. This can be for romantic reasons, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. The One Jump Ahead reprise from Disney's Aladdin is a good example of this, with Aladdin wanting to express who he is as a means of refuting the insults and prejudices he's subjected to due to his lifestyle. When defining Disney I Want songs, Howard Ashman introduced a sense of identity that's now integral to the form. Whereas in the past that was a byproduct of some plots, it became a necessity to the existence of I Want songs within the Disney catalog. As a result of this, wanting tangible things or existential experiences became byproducts. Pocahontas singing just around the riverbend is not necessary to the plot or narrative, but it is necessary for understanding the character's identity and emotional state. After Ashman introduced the I Want song to the Disney company, it was given a concrete place in the stories and a specific goal of defining the character's identity within proximity to the inciting incident. This progression is important to highlight because this definition of I Want songs is what people most often associate with the category. When retroactively applying the term I Want song to older musical theater pieces, it's important to remember that this formula had not been pre previously established in a concrete way. In addition to this, not all post-Ashman Disney I Want songs follow the direction to a T, but they are built upon the formula. There has been an I Want song in almost every mainline Disney princess film since The Little Mermaid, but some interpret the definition differently. For example, I would still consider Let It Go from Frozen to be a humanistic convincing I Want song, because of its place in the narrative and how Elsa's goal is to not only feel comfortable with herself, but prove who she is to other people by self-isolating. It's a bit different when compared to textbook definition I Want songs like The Bell Reprise and Party of world, but it's still relevant to the genre as a whole. However, as you see from the title, this video isn't just about the history of I Want songs, but why exactly they're so often heard as queer. The relationship of the LGBT community to musical theater is not just something that has a precedent in history, but also something that's continually referenced and often mocked in pop culture. Musical theater is largely defined as a gay art form, influencing both harmful stereotypes about LGBT people and also providing representation for them in fields of entertainment. But where did this association come from? Is musical theater inherently queer? Before I answer that question, let me take the time to once again clarify that, in this context, the word queer is the most succinct way I can describe art and expression that challenges notions of heteronormativity. That doesn't erase the word's history as a slur, but it makes me feel proud in reclaiming it. In order to understand why I want songs sound so queer, we have to go back to the origin of musicals and how that formed out of the role of LGBT individuals in theater. To learn more about this subject, I spoke with my husband John McDermott, professor of set design in the theater department at Adelphi University. He spoke a bit about the general history of theater and specifically its relationship relationship to expression in the arts. I think that gay people have always had an affinity for performing because in many cultures we're not allowed to exist and therefore we learned very early on how to behave in a way that made us less noticeable and therefore possibly less likely to be punished. We certainly were drawn to it not only because we identified with what was happening but maybe also as a way to sort of blend in and be looked at and admired in a way that we couldn't in normal life. There's a normalizing aspect to it in a way that we often don't have in real life. I think John has a point. Throughout the development of what we might label as theater within Western culture, the act of expression has always been something that authoritative bodies have either viewed as a tool or a threat. This can be seen in history via various governments and religious institutions. Because of the freedom of expressing oneself through art forms like theater, many people have felt liberated by the idea of acting. In the same way, certain types of theater have also become safe havens for outcasts and marginalized communities in societies that look down on the profession. In his collection of essays, Our Love is Here to Stay, John Kenrick describes this relationship well. In a business where actress Sarah Bernhardt blithely announced that she slept in a coffin, no one really cared if a supporting actor was that way, or if an effeminate dresser twinkled with admiration as he assisted the leading man into a costume. In cultures that are not very welcoming to LGBT individuals, many people are forced to learn how to code switch. To put it simply, code switching in this context refers to LGBT people who might have to change their usage of language or inflection to present a certain way to others. For many LGBT people, code switching is a method of survival. I think gay people or queer people have always learned that in some situations, it's safer for them to be able to change their behavior, their words, their dress, 
anything so that they can blend in and get what they need to survive in that moment. Mm -hmm. The skills of code switching that are inherently thrust upon many LGBT people also lend themselves well to acting, possibly being a reason that many people have felt comfortable with in an already somewhat welcoming profession. There's certainly also the fantasy aspect of theater, of imagining a better life for everybody and helping to create that on stage, even mm -hmm. temporarily. In the mid-1800s, the development of musical theater also helped provide an outlet and safe haven for groups of people who were not very welcomed by society. Before the term musical theater was even coined, operatic composers in Europe were experimenting with types of shows that involved less drama and more so cheap gags, like musical scores and risque satire. This genre of operetta called opera bouffe, largely associated with the composer Jacques Offenbach, was considered by mainstream society to be often vulgar and lowbrow when compared to high art of the time. However, many people preferred this emerging type of art that played to more universal and immediate feelings instead of complex and intellectual operas. This gave way to the demi-monde culture of France, a sort of subculture that was part of the audience for Offenbach productions. They all came from an aristocratic background and commanded absolute authority in questions of sophisticated behavior. Their frivolity expressed itself in the contempt they had for the bourgeoisie. They expressed this contempt by living a life that consciously transgressed middle-class conventions. As the genre of operetta developed, subgenres were created that were not as risque as the French productions, such as the Savoy operas written by Gilbert and Sullivan. That being said, those shows still had a reputation among communities who we might label today as LGBT, but they were still seen as a more respectable entertainment option. Offenbach and Opera Bouffe would also have an influence on art in the United States, with many shows being brought over to major metropolitan cities like New York. In fact, a reviewer for the Tribune once said that one of Offenbach's operettas was the most revolting mass of filth that has ever been shown on the boards of a respectable place of amusement in the city. The show is not merely indecent, it grovels in a low depth, even below decency. To put it simply, these types of shows shows were not well respected by mainstream society. Because of their openness about sexuality and taboo subjects, they also attracted many audience members we might label in contemporary terms as part of some LGBT culture. Combined with folk music, variety shows, and other types of pre-vaudeville forms of entertainment, European operetta influenced what would become the American musical. There isn't an exact line to draw as to when exactly the musical as a concept was fully formed, but many attribute 1866's The Black Crook as not being the first musical, but being the first to be a smash hit. The loose format of the show prioritized entertainment over narrative, following a similar format to the aforementioned operettas that helped set the stage for American musical theater. Coincidentally, in 1867, the word homosexuality would be invented, finally giving many an actual identity that didn't have many negative societal connotations. However, it's important to stress that this is unrelated to the development of musical theater. It's just an interesting fact that shows you how these things developed at similar times. I also want to clarify that our contemporary notions of gender and sexuality cannot be applied effectively to the past, as there were different understandings of those subjects than we have today. One example is the Urning movement in Germany that suggested that homosexual men and women were part of a third gender that involved being placed quote-unquote in the wrong body. So sometimes the word gay in this context refers to much more than we might now understand it to mean. But I digress. With the history of musical theater in mind, it makes sense that many people felt accepted in the profession, regardless of their sexuality or gender. Gay men did not enjoy unalloyed acceptance in this work environment, to be sure. But the theatrical milieu did offer them more tolerance than most workplaces. Some men could be openly gay among their co-workers, and many others were at least unlikely to suffer serious retribution if their homosexuality were discovered. On top of this, LGBT tropes continued to be integrated into the fabric of musical theater through stereotypical jokes and also underground representation through periods such as the pansy craze. Even though American society at large still rejected the notion of queerness, LGBT individuals were still able to express themselves through performance, fantasy, and acting. The introduction of the Hayes Code also made it more difficult for studios to express sexuality, leading to the notion of queer coding as a way to depict LGBT individuals through stereotypes. I also want to clarify that LGBT experience was and is intersectional, meaning that race also affected how one was perceived by society. By the time I Want songs started appearing in musicals and films, such as The Wizard of Oz, the bond between LGBT culture and musical theater was strong. The plots of many films and musicals also fit well into the archetype of what it meant and means to exist as an LGBT person in America. Why did MGM's The Wizard of Oz become a lasting focal point of gay culture? Consider the core plot. A misunderstood child yearns to escape a boring middle American upbringing and learns that one must face life's challenges with brains, heart, and courage. A blueprint that carries special resonance for many gays and lesbians. And although L. Frank Baum's story had been in print since 1900, there's no suggestion that homosexuals felt any special connection to it until the 1939 screen version came along. The endearing euphemism for gay men, Friends of Dorothy, caught on as early as World War II, when rumor has it that U.S. Army intelligence had to be reassured that the phrase did not refer to a German spy. 
inspiring. The very definition of I want songs requires that they focus specifically on a character feeling trapped in their current life or lifestyle. That archetype can represent a variety of situations, but it feels especially relevant when you consider the long history of the LGBT community's relationship to the art form. This is why I want songs like Over the Rainbow continue to have influence on the LGBT community to this day. And this is also why I believe Disney I want songs are consistently relevant in the childhoods of LGBT individuals. With the post Howard Ashman focus on identity, they represent a form of expression, allowing people to empathize with self-discovery. When I listen to Elsa sing Let It Go, it's hard for me to not think about that singular moment during which I realized that I am who I am and there's nothing I should have to hide about that. It would take years of figuring out how to do that and eventually coming out, but that moment of understanding that it was inevitable resonates whenever I hear Let the Storm Rage On. Hearing Moana sing about wanting to find a way to the place she needs to be in feels incredibly poignant when I think about the many things I had to overcome to find my place within the LGBT community. I don't think it's a coincidence that LGBT individuals are so drawn to Disney I Want songs. Though the ideas of wanting and longing are abstract, the musical archetype only grows in meaning when you consider how much the art form of musical theater has developed alongside the LGBT community, providing representation, comfort, and context. This is why it's no surprise to me that I Want songs sound so queer. Whether the protagonist is singing about a storm, the ocean, or overcoming adversity, the message of perseverance is clear. Keep going and you'll find it even if you have to go over the rainbow. Cleve and I danced the same way. We always raised our arms up above our heads, snapping our fingers like Diana Ross. We'd shake our hips like Tina Turner, acid cheerleaders twirling in psychedelic, funkadelic circles. The crowd was as much a part of the show as the band. Everyone was there. Dance fused us, magical and cleansing. We were all in a swirl of color and light. It was like a rainbow. A rainbow. That's the moment when I knew exactly what kind of flag I would make. A rainbow flag was a conscious choice, natural and necessary. The rainbow came from earliest recorded history as a symbol of hope. In the book of Genesis, it appeared as proof of a covenant between God and all living creatures. It was also found in Chinese, Egyptian, and Native American history. A rainbow flag would be our modern alternative to the pink triangle. Now the rioters who claimed their freedom at the Stonewall Bar in 1969 would have their own symbol of liberation. I want adventure in the great wide somewhere I want it more than I can tell And for once it might be grand To have someone understand I want so much more than they've got planned 